Okay, so let's talk about the forehead, uh, horizontal forehead lines uh, and our approach uh, to treating these in our patients. So I'm going to start with a little bit of anatomy um, and thinking about uh, occipital frontalis. So occipital frontalis is this sort of large uh, muscle which, which covers much of the skull um, and with, within occipital frontalis there are really two bellies. So we've got this anterior or frontal belly known as frontalis. Um, and then we've got this uh, posterior or occipital belly uh, really at the back of the head. Um, between each of these bellies is a large area of connective tissue, the extent of which is variable patient to patient, but it is aponeurosis. This connective tissue is known as aponeurosis and specifically in this area it's known as the galea or the galea aponeurotica. Okay, so in terms of occipital frontalis, it's really this frontal belly or frontalis uh, which concerns us. Uh, it concerns us because it's the use or engaging of frontalis which causes horizontal forehead lines uh, and which guides and drives our aesthetic practice. So when we think about frontalis and we think about its origin, its origin is variable, person to person, um, and that is really something which is important in terms of uh, what we do clinically. Uh, its insertion is common. Um, its insertion is, is in the region of the supraorbital rim where it in intermingles with the other muscles of facial expression in the upper face, namely orbicular, soculi, procerus, and the corrugators. Okay, so a really useful cadaver-based study from 2016 by Abramo et al. I'm going to include uh, a link uh, to this study uh, below. Uh, looked at uh, four common patterns of distribution of frontalis in, in cadaver specimens. Um, and this study really resonated with me because it kind of correlated with what I was seeing uh, in, in my own practice and helped to guide and, and really explain what I was seeing in these patients and ergo helped to guide my injecting patterns. So when we look at this study, so the, the four common patterns are number one, full form. So full form basically describes where the entire visible forehead is covered by muscle. So there's no uh, aponeurosis or very little aponeurosis on the visible forehead at all. The second form was V-shape, where you have a sort of uh, frontal, frontal bellies of frontalis either side of the midline separated by uh, an area, a variable area of aponeurosis uh, in the midline uh, of the visible forehead. The third form was central form whereby the only area of the forehead occupied by frontalis muscle was, was the middle or the, the central portion and the lateral forms were covered by aponeurosis only so there was no uh, muscle uh, laterally at all. And then the fourth form was lateral form, where the only area of visible forehead occupied by muscle was laterally, and more commonly low and laterally, uh, which um, we'll talk about a little bit more um, as we go on in terms of what, what do these patterns of distribution mean in terms of what we see when patients engage frontalis, and then from that, how can this help to guide our injection technique? Okay, so let's look uh, a little bit more closely uh, at each of these forms described uh, in this study. So you can see here uh, an example, uh, an animated form um, of what was described in the cadaver study. You can see the specifics of the cadaver specimens in, in this study if you read the article. Um, so we're going to start with full form where the entire visible forehead is occupied by frontalis muscle. And what uh, this particular form looks like when, when, we see an when we see a patient engage frontalis. So this is an example of one of my patients with what I would describe as full form uh, frontalis uh, distribution. Um, and how someone like this I typically treat um, is, is like this. So if you have a look, you can see my pattern of injection, uh, the, the doses used for this particular patient um, and this, this would constitute my kind of typical pattern for treating a patient like this. Okay, so let's look at V-shape or V-form uh, pattern of frontalis distribution now. So you can see that we have muscle bulk, 
um, laterally and, and typically low or close to the supraorbital rim um, in patients of this kind of distribution. And centrally there is sparing or uh, an area of dehiscence where there isn't any muscle at all. The, the only thing that's covering that area of the visible forehead is aponeurosis. So someone like this, uh, typically when they engage frontalis, this is the kind of thing that you're gonna see. Um, and then with someone like that, this, this would be my kind of typical injection pattern um, that I would use to treat uh, someone whose forehead lines look like this. Okay, so let's look at central form now. So again, this is someone who, when they engage frontalis, uh, the, the, the lines that are visible are only in the midline. So there's only muscle in the midline. There's nothing lateral to midline. This is quite an unusual um, pattern and one that you'll definitely see less frequently. Um, in terms of my pattern of injection for this, it would look something like this. Okay, let's look at lateral form. So lateral form is probably the least common um, that I see, certainly in my own practice. Um, it's probably the most difficult to treat where a patient engages from talus. When you look at the horizontal lines that form, they tend to only form laterally and very close to the supraorbital rim. Um, and this is tricky. Um, so this is particularly tricky because particularly in an older patient where they've already got a little bit of upper lid laxity um, and, you're, and you're in such close proximity to the, to the supraorbital rim that even slightly overdoing the dose or using any toxin at all might give them a bryotosis. So you gotta be very careful with these patients. I'm always very conscious um, of thinking carefully about, well, should we be treating these patients at all? I think if they're a little bit older, they've got a little bit of upper lid laxity, I would be very careful about about doing this at all. I mean, the other option for a patient like this is to use a little bit of very soft filler using the superficial blanching technique to treat those low lines on frontalis, particularly in that older upper lid laxity type group. Um, if I've got a young person who's like this, this would be the kind of pattern that I would go for. So laterally only, um, relatively low, and as you can see, the dose, um, definitely lower uh, versus other injection patterns. I hope you enjoyed this content. If you did, hit like, subscribe, and share to see a bit more.